I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, concatenative syn synthesis more broadly as I, as I see it relating to electronic music software, uh, generally speaking. And I'm going to try to make an argument, essentially, that concatenative synthesis can be seen in some ways as radical, but as I wrote in my abstract, I'm also going to try to say that I think catnip synthesis can also be related to acoustic composition tradition going back a couple of hundred years. Um, uh, we'll then get into the software and I'll sort of go through piece by piece uh, and sort of uh, uh, different aspects of how the user can control the process and parameterize it. Um, I'll give a bunch of examples along the way, um, not necessarily a super exhaustive set of examples, but hopefully something that will uh, whet your appetite and also be representative of what's possible. At the end, I'll sort of be done talking about the program in detail and I'll give some more, I'll just call them experimental examples where I do some things that are maybe, we don't traditionally associate with concatenative synthesis and walk you through a couple of uh, possibilities. I've got some excerpts of pieces I've written and I'll talk about musical writing, um, meaning using software to write instrumental parts and I'll uh, do a couple of other things too uh, at the end of the talk. Um, feel free to chime in any time. We'll keep it casual, and I'll try to not make this into a lecture um, uh, as much as possible. So feel free to throw up your hand or just shout at me if you have any questions or want additional information about something I'm saying. Um, the title for my talk is Creating New Tools for Authoring Music, um, which I hope is kind of a strange-sounding construction. I don't think we often hear people talking about software as a tool for authoring music. And I want to spend some time breaking down this idea of authorship in electronic music. Uh, at the beginning. Um, of course, I'll be focusing mostly on Audio Guide, which I would be remiss to not say is a cl very collaborative project um, that I am indebted to various people at IRCOM. Uh, and I'll recognize them in a second. Um, it's a program that started in 2011. I was at IRCOM as um, composing residence for musical research um, a couple of times between 2011 to 2015. And um, I wrote most of the code for Audio Guide myself. Those of you who are programmers will, and have looked at the code will know that I'm not a particularly good programmer. Um, but uh, Audio Guide would not have been possible without the input, guidance, and ideas of lots of people at IRCOM uh, to single out sort of maybe the, the most important ones, uh, Norbert Schnell, Dina Schwartz, Philippe Essling, uh, Marcia Conte, who's no longer there, as well as Jovar Nuno, who I think technically is also no, no longer there. Um, so, uh, creating new tools for authoring music. Um, I want to start by talking about sort of where I see electronic music software as currently being in terms of what it, what it lets us do well and what it doesn't let us do very well. Um, when I think about electronic music um, and, and think about kind of what programs allow us to do, generally speaking, I'm super impressed by the ability that we have to parameterize and sculpt and transform individual sonic elements. Yeah? And I think this is pretty true regardless of what program you use, if you're using uh, C-Sound, or if you're using SuperCollider, or Maximus P Pure Data, or if you're using um, a SuperCollider. Um, you're able to, at a really microscopic level, uh, transform and sculpt and make really compelling changes to sonic utterances. And this is, I think, true whether you're doing some sort of synthesis or whether you're working with samples. Um, I think most composers who start on the path of composing with electronic music are seduced into doing so by the tools that we have with, to change sound and to manipulate sound with an enormous degree of, of precision. Um, and the thing I, I wanted when I was speaking about what I think the strengths of programs are, generally speaking, I wanted to really zero in on this term sonic utterances which is to say I think almost all electronic tools are geared almost too much towards the editing of individual units, of individual things. Almost everyone I know who writes music in Pro Tools, for instance, pulls up uh, uh, the screen and, and starts to input sounds and change them, and pretty much all of the mixing together of sounds, all of the creation of time, all of the way that gestures are assembled is pretty much done by hand uh, across the board. And I know there's some exceptions to this, but broadly speaking, while we have amazing tools for editing and addressing individual sounds and being able to change them and sculpt them in really precise and compelling ways, we don't, I think, generally speaking, have very good tools for dealing with time or for constructing gesture. And I think, you know, when you think about how young electronic music is, this kind of makes sense. The first 50 years or so of electronic music, uh, I think we're largely fo focused on making a really uh, 
a basic set of tools for doing simple things in a kind of piecewise way. Uh, um, and as a result, a lot of the programs we use, while they're really powerful at the sound by sound level, um, are not necessarily very powerful when it comes to composers strategizing and working in a larger time frame. Um, so I think that this issue is not necessarily unique to electronic music. Um, you know, electronic music, because it affords us so much control over how things sound and how we can edit those sounds and change those sounds, I think electronic music has a kind of particular case of this decision overload problem, uh, especially at the microscopic level. But I, I see a lot of parallels between electronic music and acoustic composition, specifically writing music for full orchestra, which is to say writing a piece of music that involves lots and lots and lots of instruments. Um, this is, of course, a, a page of uh, the score of Strauss's and Heldenleben, a very nicely orchestrated piece, if I may say so. And somewhat similar to the problems I'm talking about with electronic music, with constructing time and managing sort of your decision making, I think orchestral music has a similar kind of conundrum. You have an enormous amount of details that you have to manage and strategize and finesse as a composer. Um, and it's really easy to get distracted by the density of decisions you have to make in every part and in every bar and kind of forget about time and forget about gesture and forget about the cumulative. Um, and uh, you can imagine, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have tried, if you try to write a piece of for full orchestral music and start in bar one and complete every decision in bar one before you go on to bar two, you will likely not have a very, maybe interesting piece of music. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But um, it's very, uh, like electronic music composition, thinking horizontally poses similar challenges in this large orchestral domain. And it turns out, of course, you know, going back hundreds of years, composers don't write this kind of music starting in bar one and then moving to bar two and then moving to bar three. They uh, do it somewhat differently. This is a picture of uh, someone that I pulled off Google Images. I have no idea who he is. I only know that he has a more impressive mustache than I do. <laughs> doesn't say much, but they have it. Um, he is a composer. Let's say this is in 1900, and he is writing a piece. I have no idea what piece he's writing, but he's doing something that for us composers is fairly familiar. He's writing a piece at the piano. And let's stipulate for, the, for my argument that he is writing a piece for large orchestra, which does not include a piano. For those of us who are composers, this is a very natural sounding situation. But there's something really strange about this. He's working at an instrument whose sounds and timbres have nothing to do with the instruments that he's actually writing for in the end, yeah? He's not really writing for the piano, he's not writing for those sounds, those timbres, uh, those harmonic components. He is writing through the piano. The piano is not an instrument, so to speak, in this situation. The piano is a tool. And there's some problems with using the piano as a tool this way. Of course, you're working in a, in a space where you don't hear timbral differences between the kinds of resources you have in a full orchestra. But the advantage of working this way, the advantage of using the piano as a tool for, to write music through, um, is that you're able to explore the relational constructs of music without having to worry about all the other stuff. You're not starting from a, a blank page and trying to fill in all the details first. You're sitting down at a piano, which is, a, in this case, a kind of interface, and you can explore the relational constructs of music, meaning the relationship between pitches to make melodies or to make harmonies, uh, the relationship between temporal moments to make rhythms. <coughs> you can explore unfettered and unrestricted by all of the decision-making you eventually will have to make to make a final passage of music. Yeah? And this is a pretty common idea, this idea of an orchestral score or a piano score, that starts off fairly simple and then gets later put into much more uh, detail when the piece is actually finished or, or in process. Now, I don't want to suggest that um, by breaking music composition into these two steps, creating a kind of abstracted idea of music and gesture and time, and then later uh, you know, creating a full orchestral version that has more details and, and more choices, I don't want to suggest that they always have to be sort of put uh, bifurcated in a kind of hard way into these two categories. Of course, when you're writing an orchestral piece of the piano, you can think about who might be playing a particular line as you're writing. You have a, the space between these two things is somewhat fluid. But the power of using the piano as a tool for writing music through is that you have the ability, you have the choice as a composer not to have to worry about a large set of decisions which can often, I think, make us uh, stumble and make us not lose sight of the cumulative. 
And instead, you can focus on this abstracted notion of what you want your music to be. So this idea of authorial tools for the composer, tools that help us design our music, is actually, I think, a pretty old idea. I think the first instance of it is indeed the piano or some kind of keyboard instrument that we use to organize our ideas in a kind of stretch, uh, scratch, abstracted space first that then gets a full-blown implementation with more detail and uh, with more attention to different kinds of uh, sonic things. Now, of course, nowadays the piano as a tool for organizing your music is has maybe fallen out of favor slightly. I mean, I know probably everyone in this room writes different kinds of music, but um, for those of us you know, who are not PA, who write music with noises, for instance, um, we have to figure out ways to structure our music. Um, and the piano is not necessarily a very good tool for representing the kinds of sounds and the kinds of content we're working with. I mean, the piano is a pitch-centric world. And thinking about using the piano as a scratch space only works if your music is pretty much about pitch. If your music is not primarily about pitch or doesn't even involve pitches of any kind, the piano stop, ceases to be functional as a tool for organizing your ideas. And my question, the reason, I, the reason I'm posing the piano and thinking about tools for authoring music in this way is, what do we have in electronic music that functions like this? What do we have that lets us express our ideas in a kind of abstracted way with some degree of precision over the the relational gestural ideas that we want, maybe morphological is a better word when thinking about electronic music, but what do we have that lets us specify ideas with precision yet somehow detached from uh, its musical instantiation such that we can explore and refine, refine and improvise and make mistakes and find things we didn't know we wanted and work in a kind of fluid way. Um, my answer to my own question is I think not very much at the moment, yeah, and I think I think the, if the last 50 years of electronic music software has been about primarily about sound making devices and operating on the sound as an individual element in a texture or in a piece of music, that the next 20 or so years will focus a lot more heavily on this idea of authorship and this idea of creating abstract spaces for us to express ourselves intuitively with some degree of precision that prescribes what we want in a piece but somehow is detached from all of the details and indeed perhaps even the sounds that are used to actually articulate the structure in the end. So I call this the orchestrator's keyboard as a tool for thinking about um, a traditional way of abstracting one's music, creating a scratch space for composing, refining, improvising uh, with a degree of fluidity and caprice that then you can muster into uh, a more complex uh, musical or sonic setting later. And indeed, um, Audio Guide's workflow, I'll skip this part. Um, the workflow of Audio Guide is much like the workflow of most concatenative synthesis programs. One has a target sound file, a terminology which I assume most of you are pretty familiar with. Yeah. One has a target sound file, um, which essentially encapsulates some sort of gestural or morphological intent on the part of the composer. It is um, a kind of abstract space where you can specify a certain pattern whether it be rhythmic, whether it be in terms of pitch, dynamics, or indeed timbre, maybe a yoking or a combination of all of those things. Um, but in the target, you specify some kind of morphological intent. Uh, you marry that, of course, to a corpus, which is rather than morphological or temporal intent, it is a kind of morphological resource, an out-of-time collection of sounds, of uh, utterances of some kind. The program then, audio guiding, in the case of lots of other concatenative synthesis software uh, packages, uh, does some operations to create an output sound, which is the morphological trajectory of the target in some way resynthesized with or approximated uh, with sounds of the corpus. Going back to this idea of the orchestrator's keyboard, I think it fits really nicely into the idea of orchestration. Yeah, the target sound file is, you can see it as your piano score, you can see it as your scratch space for constructing the relational ideas of your music that you want to be present. You can think about the corpus as your orchestra. It is your full set of sound possibilities. And the output sound file essentially is a kind of automatic orchestration of the trajectories found in the target sound file, but using the resources found in the corpus. Is that clear? Um, I want to give a couple of quick examples of how Audio Guide sounds before I kind of take a deeper dive into looking at the program in a more sort of careful uh, and deliberate way. 
Um, some of these examples I think are online, maybe some of them aren't, so you might be familiar with some of them. Apologies if you've already heard them. Um, uh, since 2011, when I started doing this program, oops, I have been using um, a sound file of John Cage's voice from Indeterminacy. I'm not exactly sure how this came about. I think speech is a pretty good morphological um, carrier because our ears are very attuned to the timbral changes in speech over time. So I think vocal targets or the use of one's voice is a very successful way of embodying a morphological intent. And I'll talk about this a little bit later with some examples from my own music. Um, but somehow Cage found his way into my I then brain, see. and he has uh, occupied a space in the examples pages ever since. So those of you who have looked at the program a little bit will be familiar with this, uh, this section of speech from Cage. I then said to David Tudor, the lecture is so soon that I don't think I'll be able to get all 90 stories written. Um, the corpus in this first example that I'll play for you is about a 10 minute sound recording from I think the BBC Soundfile uh, CDs, back when we used those, um, of Birdsong. Here's just a little snippet of how the corpus sounds, uh, though this is not the entire file. So in short, when you give this information to Audio Guide plus some other parameters, which I'll talk about in a second, it will split up this corpus resource into individual utterances and try to figure out a way to represent the morphology of John Cage's voice with the uh, sounds found in the corpus, in this case the sound of birdsong. Here I'll play for you just John Cage's voice mixed with the output, the output in this case being birdsong arranged to follow uh, Cage's dynamics and, and uh, timbre uh, to a certain extent. I then said to David Tudor, the lecture is so soon that I don't think I'll be able to get all. Okay, and just the output by itself, you should, you should hear some degree of semblance between John Cage, pacing, timbre, maybe the change of pitch over time, and the, and the bird output on its own. I then said to David Tudor, the lecture is so soon. Sorry. I don't know why PowerPoint has such a bad sound file interface. <clears throat> OK, so the interesting thing, of course, about using a target as a morphological idea or some distilled or abstracted version of a mor morphological intent is that, of course, we can use many different uh, corpi. We can use many different kinds of sound resources and instantiate the same kinds of morphological ideas. Here, I'll give the, a very different corpus about a 10 minute recording of me doing nasty things to a snare drum. <laughs> and the output, which is to say John Cage's voice mixed with uh, these snare drum sounds to follow his morphology. I then said to David Peter, the lecture is so soon that I don't think I'll be able to get all 90 stories written. I'll come back to this example a little bit later because it, um, uh, when I detail kind of the layering strategy that Audio Guide uses for superimposing multiple sounds. That's just to give you a kind of sense for those of you who haven't uh, seen the program before of how, of the kinds of things it can do, the kinds of inputs it can take, and what kind of semblance is possible between an output and a target. Um, so I'd like to go through now some basic things about how Audio Guide works, if it's okay. Um, so you uh, can down audio, download Audio Guide from the internet. Of course, it is a, um, a free program. It is, it is licensed on, on BSD. So Audio Guide is a freely downloadable program. It is open source in the sense that the code is all there and you can look at it and play with it uh, and do whatever you want with it. Um, you're able to find all releases online. You're also able to look at some examples as well as I think is some pretty lengthy and, and carefully written documentation. Um, when you download Audio Guide, you will get a tarball. Yeah, I don't actually want to download it again. You will get a tarball that you can open, and you should get an Audio Guide folder that comes out as the result. 
The folder basically consists of a bunch of scripts that I've written that do different kinds of things that you can launch, scripts that are, that are Python-based. Um, it consists of a folder which is the audio guide module. This is the, essentially where the guts of the program live uh, and where um, all of the, most of the code for the important things that happen in the program is inside of this folder. Some people have edited this content, most people don't. Most people sort of play with the scripts or change things in these, uh, these scripts I've written that are outside the module folder. Um, documentation lives with every distribution, so you will have a fixed, not online version of the documentation. And there's also an examples folder uh, that has a couple of different examples for how to use the program. Generally speaking, the examples could probably be better, they could probably be more, be, be more numerous, be more detailed, uh, something that some of us would like to start working on in the next uh, couple of months, perhaps, and sort of expanding. If anyone's interested in um, contributing some examples or has ideas about things they'd like to see on this, in this example section, I'd be more than happy to uh, have a think about it and, and see what's possible. So using Audio Guide essentially comes down to interacting with these scripts, at least in a, in a generic way, uh, and uh, 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 writing some options and dealing with some of the documentation. Um, I want to start just by talking about some call segmentation. Um, so uh, Audio Guide works primarily with sound segments. And um, this was a kind of uh, very purposeful aesthetic choice I made early on when we were writing the software. I was not, and this isn't maybe necessarily as true now, but back then I was not as interested in very granular sounding cut up things. I was more interested in a, keeping the idea of a sound segment as being an acoustically whole unit that has a beginning and an end, that doesn't have clipping, that doesn't uh, have jagged edges, more or less. Um, and so uh, because of that, um, I keep in Audio Guide the process of cutting the corpus sound files into chunks separate from the process of doing concatenation. They are discrete uh, uh, scripts that you run at different times. And the idea behind that really is that sound segmentation is not a perfect science. It very much is in the eye of the beholder as to what a sound segment is. It's very context-based. And so um, I have a separate script that's called AG Segment SF for segmenting long sound files into little bits which is separate from the concatenation script, which will then use those bits to make uh, output. Um, when you first uh, unpack the program and use it, um, uh, one of the example sound files that's used quite a lot is this uh, sound file of music by Helmut Lachemann. This is from uh, Mouvement, uh, a piece for a large ensemble by Lachemann. It's a one and a half minute excerpt of it, I believe, or about one minute excerpt of it. And the first thing we're going to do is simply run the segmentation script to break this sound file into smaller pieces. Now, all of the scripts for Audio Guide kind of follow this standard Unix convention of if you want to know more about it, you can run the script name minus H, and it will tell you a bunch of different options that are possible, as well as a summary of somewhat of how the script works. In a lot of ways, I think the documentation is much more verbose and clear about how to run these uh, uh, scripts. And indeed, in the documentation, there is a section uh, for different uh, scripts that come with the, the software and discusses how to use them uh, in some detail. Um, but the segmentation script is pretty straightforward. In a lot of ways, it takes uh, the segment script uh, as the first argument and the name of the sound file you want to cut into pieces as the second argument. Now, I should say that you know some of you may be working with sound files that are pre-segmented in a folder. That's totally fine and usable with Audio Guide. You don't need to use this step if you're working with you know uh, sound file library sounds that are sort of pre-cut into, into individual units. In the case of Lachemann, you'll see it's you know, a reasonably long sound file that clearly uh, would benefit from being broken into chunks. Ah, sorry. I forgot to change my interface. Okay, so if we want to segment this into, sorry, into um, individual sounds, we run the segment script. Um, essentially what the segment script will do is do a full descriptor analysis of this sound file, the Lachemann sound file. It will think for a little bit and it will break the sound file into segments. Now it will break them into segments not by cutting the sound file and making a bunch of additional files on your file system. It will do it simply by um, creating a text file, which has the same name as the sound file. And inside this text file, there's essentially one segment per line. Um, the first entry is the start time, the end time, and then some information about why that segment started and stopped, the trigger threshold for 
creating the onset and the reason for creating the offset. Now it's kind of a janky format for specifying segmentation. I mean, I could certainly find a more Pythonic or cleaner sort of way of doing this. But the reason it is done this way is because the sound file segment uh, segmentation format for audio guide is identical to Audacity's label format, which means you can import your labels into Audacity that you just created. And you will see all of the segments and again some information about why the segmentation happened and why certain sounds were picked. Uh, why, why the onset algorithm started and stopped. So this is kind of the first step you have to do. Again, um, Segmentation, I think, is an open-ended aesthetic problem that needs to remain flexible. So there's quite a few options in the segment script for specifying how things start, how things stop, what the threshold values are, that kind of thing. So that's more or less the segmentation. I just want to talk quickly through example one, just so we're sort of on the same page about uh, how the example files work. So once you have your sound files segmented, the second step, the second and only step after that, is to run the concatenative algorithm. This is done through a script called ag concatenate, uh, concatenate, sorry, and it only takes one argument, like the previous, um, like the previous example, which is the name of an options file. Options files in Audacity are the place where you put all of the parameters that specify how concatenation is supposed to happen and what you want the program to do. Um, option, options files are are, mo are sort of Pythonic in their syntax. They are a list of variables that parameterize what the target is, that parameterize the corpus, that talk about how similarity is measured between the two, and also talk about superimposition of the target and the corpus, how the corpus is layered or not to create uh, the ultimate uh, output sound file. Um, so there's two kinds of options, broadly speaking, that you deal with. Some of them are objects, as is the case for the target, as is the case for a corpus, as is the case for some of the search variables, and I'll talk about these steps in a lot more detail in a bit. Um, and then some of them are just regular old variables that you define with a name. If you want to change the bit rate of the CSound output file, you just write CSound bits equals 24, and then if your output sound file is it's a 24-bit file rather than a 16-bit one. So two kinds of variables. Um, there's a lot of them which are performed, and they're in the documentation, just by simple assignment. Um, the more complicated ones, and probably the ones that are more interesting and the ones you'll use and interact with more intensely, are objects. And the reason they're objects in sort of Python scripting kind of language is because each of them has a bunch of keyword arguments that let you specify and parameterize different aspects of how it works. So the corpus sound uh, file object um, has, you know, something like 30 um, different, where is it, uh, corpus variable, has lots and lots of different keyword objects that can affect how that corpus sound file or folder is read, processed, made available to the algorithm, et cetera. So the object, the reason some of the variables are in object format is really to make it easier so you don't have to do a bunch of typing and specify a bunch of variables per line. You can change the keyword arguments from the default values as, as you please. And it's somewhat, I think, transparent and easy to use. OK, so just to talk quickly through our simple example before I run it on the, in the software. Um, so in the target variable, we, of course, specify our target sound file. Uh, full and relative paths work in audio guide, relative paths being relative to the uh, location of the options file. Um, you specify a triggering threshold for the target. Unlike the corpus, the target is segmented when the script is run. So the target is broken into chunks uh, when, when the concatenative algorithm is launched. The corpus has been pre-segmented in some way. Um, you'll recall we just uh, segmented the Wacomon file and it created that uh, text file, which includes all of the information about the segments in that file. Um, if you had a folder called Wacomon and inside that folder you wanted uh, all of the sound files to be used as individual elements, you simply give the folder name and tell Audio Guide that the keyword whole file is true and it will then use well, each individual sound file found in that folder as an individual corpus entry, as an individual possibility. So the corpus is where you specify all of your sound files for, for, to create your kind of reservoir of morphological uh, possibility. Um, this is a list in Python, meaning you can you know, have as many different sound files as you want. You can mix sound files and folders. You can do all sorts of things in terms of creating a corpus that encapsulates the kind of sound activity you want, to, you want the program to analyze and, and use. So the corpus is a list of corpus objects. The corpus variable is a list of C 
SF objects. Um, the search variable is where you tell Audio Guide how to pick how to pick corpus sounds which match the target. In search, you are essentially specifying something about how the concatenative algorithm selects uh, sounds from the corpus to fit the target. And there's some, I hope, interesting aspects to this that we'll talk about a little bit later when I detail this variable in, with a bit more precision. But that's what search does. You specify descriptors here, and you specify how similarity essentially is measured or evaluated by the program. Finally, there's an object called superimpose. This is an object where through a bunch of keywords you can tell the algorithm how layered you want sounds to be, meaning when it's picking corpus sounds to match the target, do you want one sound per target segment from the corpus or do you want 10? How do you want them to overlap? And in what way will the program think about mixing things together? Um, and again, when I talk about this in more in depth, I'll spend more time talking about how mixture works, both from a similarity point of view as well as um, uh, more experientially, give you some examples of that. So, um, running the program is as simple as, as opening the terminal after you've done the segmentation, giving the concatenation script, and then giving it the examples file will essentially run the software and it will automatically play the resulting sound file at the command line if all things go well. It's, of course, using the same target we've been listening to a bunch of times already, so I won't play it for you again. Um, before I get into talking about these individual steps, are there any kind of questions or concerns that you have or you want me to address or emphasize as I'm going through how things work? Are you going to go in more detail about each of the steps? Yes. Congratulations, your, your stuff works. When you download it, that's not to be uh, overestimated. And the documentation, you, you've been in Britain for too long. You, your documentation is quite good. Um, it uh, wasn't just me, but yeah. But yes, it, it, it works. Uh, a specific question. Uh, does it support both versions? I can't remember. Both versions of Python? Yeah, it works in Python 2 and Python 3. It is OSX only at the moment because of a descriptor issue, which I hope to be fixed. But uh, legal action is pending. I'm just <laughs> it's being sorted out. So you'll, it does work for Python your, three. you'll talk about your favorite descriptors later, I presume? My favorite descriptors? I, I mean, I'll, I'll mention some things that I think work well uh, when I talk about searching, yeah. Um, I don't know about favorites, but I'll certainly give some ideas about what I think is meaningful. But I think that's a really context-dependent question and should this be left open. Like segmentation? Yeah. Good. Um, I want to start by talking about descriptors, and I want to start by talking about similarity. Um, first thing I want to say is that, yeah. You're going to talk about the segmentation. <laughs> Are you going to talk about segmentation in more detail? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah I, was, I was guessing uh, when you say all the steps. So uh, okay. Segmentation, uh, segmentation is pretty straightforward. Um, it's pretty much stolen from Norbert Schnell. Um, and it is uh, uh, a first, let's see, it, is, it takes uh, uh, RMS power, amplitude, I think filtered. Um, uh, in some ways first for low frequency problems, but it takes an RMS amplitude descriptor and does the difference between the current frame and the median of the last seven frames to get an onset detection function. And then it basically uses that, that new wave, that new um, time series uh, for thresholding both onsets as well as offsets. So it's always amplitude based only for segmentation? Always amplitude based at the moment. Initially I made segmentation that had you could basically pick your descriptor, yeah. so you could use like centroid if you had a steady amplitude but a changing timbre or, or something like that. Um, but it turned out to not be very functional. It turned out to not work well, and it's possible that that um, that you could find better solutions with a bit more hard work. But yeah, at the moment it's amplitude only, which is one of the reasons you'll, when you hear audio guide concatenations, you'll hear them being very event based, but also very I don't want to say punchy, but very they're they're very onset driven in terms of their the resulting sound profile. Um, we'll actually see, uh, uh, when I get to talking about sort of experimental things in the program, I'll talk about a frame-by-frame, non-segment-based concatenative algorithm that's also now in the software that gets rid of this idea of segments and, and doesn't have to deal with this segmentation problem either in the target or in the corpus. So when you're calling trigger and runs, what are the two thresholds for this function? Exactly, so trigger is uh, a value Translated into decibels, just for ease of 
user use to talk about how loud it has to be to start a segment. Rise is the change from the last frame to the next frame that will cause an offset, meaning if the sound suddenly gets louder, it will stop and then start a new segment after that. There's also a couple other thresholds that stop a segment if it gets too soft or stop a segment if it goes below, I think, a couple dB above the minimum dB of the sound file, that kind of thing, too. Um, all of those uh, parameters are detailed in the, in the sound file. The segment script minus H will give you um, a pretty uh, good explanation of the flags, both in terms of triggering and then the ways that uh, the sound can be, can be turned off and a new segment can start uh, because the amplitude gets louder. So the flags, I think, are reasonably well explained. But yeah, they all work on amplitude only, which, um, yeah, like I said, initially I had this idea that you could use MFCCs to trigger a new segment because the timbre will have changed in some appreciable way and you want to use that. Um, it never got off the ground. I know Norbert's working on that kind of stuff um, for textural pieces where you change the timbre of something without appreciably changing the amplitude and you want to create a new segment. He's doing that kind of stuff in Mubu. If he does it in Mubu and Max. Is that, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I want to, um, what do I want to do? I want to talk a little bit about similarity, which is to say I want to talk about this um, I want to talk broadly about similarity first, and I, I want to say that I think most research into sound similarity is driven by industry. That's kind of where a lot of the money is. And so a lot of the really interesting high-level research that's happening on sound similarity is often driven by industry and centered around things like style recognition, things like song similarity, where you want a really concrete sort of absolute number that tells you how similar this Aphex Twin song is with this Barbra Streisand song. Yeah. Um, and um, while I appreciate all of that research and think it's really interesting, I think in the kind of MIR field, um, that kind of concrete absolute notion of similarity is a bit too dominant. I think for creative people, which I think are probably most of, this pe most of the people in this room, thinking about sound similarity as being something which is super flexible, which is context dependent and which is not absolute, and which is even messy on purpose, is actually a really useful thing. That Yes, similarity between concrete elements in sound can be measured with some degree of success or not. But thinking about sound similarity in a flexible way, I think, is much more interesting and much more fruitful for creative people. Not thinking about it as some absolute black and white, um, similar or not, kind of uh, thinking about them in those kind of simple buckets. Um, uh, so with Audio Guide, um, similarity is, is, of course, measured with descriptors. And the search process, I think, is pretty flexible in terms of giving you a good degree of power in terms of how you use those descriptors to select segments. I just want to talk quickly about um, descriptors first, and then I'll talk a little bit um, uh, more about the search process. So um, as you can see, the search object is a list, which might not be what you would expect a search object to be. I think in a lot of concatenative softwares, you list a bunch of descriptors that you want to be used to measure similarity and you get out the sum of those descriptor similarities to create selected sounds. Audio Guide doesn't really, can work that way, but doesn't have to. So the basic audio, the way Audio Guide works is that you give it a, a search that you tell um, the program how you want the search to function, and I'll get to that later. And then you give it a list of descriptors, descriptors that you want Audio Guide to use to calculate similarity between uh, two sound segments, the sound segment of the corpus, the sound segments found in the corpus, and the sound segment that is the target sound segment in question. Um, more or less, these are done in a brute force, very unattractive, unsexy way. I think there's a lot of room to make this part of the program more interesting and more vibrant and responsive to like more, some more current research, maybe. But essentially, all that happens is um, if I were to ask Audio Guide to evaluate the centroid of a segment of John Cage speech, let's say, which has a particular shape. Um, this is, of course, the frame rate of the analysis. Um, it would, it essentially looks through all of the corpus sound segments that are in our corpus. Some of them are shorter and longer, but if you ask for a descriptor like centroid, it will truncate and only look at the sort of two frames in question and does a really simple first order difference, uh, sorry, does a simple least square difference to try to figure out the distance between the centroids of the John Cage sound and the centroids um, found in each corpus sample. Um, the one with the least difference wins, at least usually. Sorry, what do you do with time series? Do you compare so frame, frame by frame? frame? In this case, it's frame by frame. Okay. 
Okay. So if you ask Audio Guide for Centroid, it will compare frame by frame for the, du the minimum duration of these two things, right? Corpus sounds have a different duration than from each other, and they're not always matching the target sounds duration. And so it essentially just clips off and says, So it, it won't do that? No, it doesn't do any. Okay. It doesn't do any. It doesn't do sliding. So it doesn't do any kind of sliding. They have to be. They have to start and go on the same way in, in time. Yeah, more or less. It will, the thing we'll look at later does does some sliding. The, thing, the experimental non-segment based version. Okay. At the end, we'll do some sliding. But no. The essential idea is if John Cage has a segment that starts here and has this kind of amplitude, that we want to match that <coughs> moment in time, and sliding often blurs the articulate profile of the target, meaning if the target has a particular rhythm in it, sliding either tends to, in my experience, make that rhythm less clear, or it tends to mean you're cutting corpus sounds into non-acoustic units. Yes, okay, so you, yeah. Yeah. But what happens if the corpus sound continues on after that? Do you still accept it? Um, I think that, that's, just like, that's something you, know, you can control. You can either ignore it and fade out afterwards, yeah. or you can live with it and yeah. have a soup. Yeah, don't this create like a bias towards like the shorter songs? Like shorter songs will have better chances to be chosen. Absolutely. So one can ask for centroid. One can also ask for the descriptor centroid dash seg, which is the time weighted average of centroids put into a single number, such that um, sorry, I said time weighted average. I meant to say power weighted average, such that you take all of the frames in John Cage, you average them so that they are. You get an average which is weighted by power. You do the same thing for all the corpus segments, and then you get a single number difference to look at uh, between the two. So one of the choices you has, have as a user is whether or not to use time-varying features or features which are you know, averaged into single numbers. And that somewhat mitigates this problem. Well, it totally mitigates this problem of shorter things matching more easily and more readily than longer things, which will always be a disadvantage. Yeah, because also like you could establish like minimums in the segments of the corpus and the segments of the target to also or, or fix rates or something like that. Yeah, or I think there has been parameters in the program before that have let you divide the divide the difference by the number of frames so that there isn't so much of a penalty for how long the sound is. Um, so there's some ways around the problem of duration, but it's it's an issue and all. I'll come back to it when I talk about the search and this idea of a search that's a list of operations rather than a single operation. So for every descriptor audio guide has, it has a time varying version, which is just its name. Let's pull up the documentation really fast. Um, there is a list of all the descriptors in audio guide in an appendix in the documentation. You can see there's quite a few of them. Uh, the usual suspects are here uh, in terms of single number descriptors like duration and effective duration, um, different kinds of things which give just a single value. We then have all of our really typical um, spectral time-varying descriptors, um, as well as some harmonic descriptors that are done that are similar to the spectral descriptors, but done off a harmonic spectrum rather than a full spectrum, full, full FFT, as well as some perceptual uh, descriptors as well. So they all have this um, this option of either giving them in a time-varying form, or giving them in a, a average form that f is a single number. Um, they also you have the ability to type in any descriptor name like centroid and get a first order difference. Um, you're also able to uh, type delta delta and get a second order difference for any descriptor. I can do it. Um, you are able to take any time varying descriptor and add slope to it, which will uh, do a linear regression to find the slope over time of that descriptor and make it into a single number so that rise or fall or steadiness of centroid is what's at play rather than actual centroid values. And there's a couple other things too, what are they? Oh yeah, of course you can also do centroid, delta, sec. So it takes the first order differences of all the centroids and then does a power weighted average of them into a single number. So there's a reasonable amount of flexibility for each of these descriptors that are possible in the spectral domain, in the, you know, that are time varying in terms of having a time varying <coughs> series or have them being summarized into single numbers. Um, and therefore similarity calculations have a really different uh, kind of result because single numbers of course will uh, mitigate this issue of uh, sound fault, the duration of the match being an issue. So there's a good amount of flexibility when it comes to 
parameterizing uh, uh, and sort of fine-tuning how you want descriptors to work. Um, and if you want to use multiple descriptors in Audio Guide, which is to say, at the moment, we are just matching MFCCs, and we're finding the best MFCC match. MFCCs is a combination of, I think, the first 13 MFCCs out of the 14 MFCC analysis. Um, uh, if we want to also add set to the mix, we just simply add as many uh, D objects as we want. Let's say I'll also want to add the linear slope regression power as another descriptor. What essentially this will do as we're adding on more and more descriptors is make the selected sample not just a question of who's the best MFCCs, but a combination of who has the best of all of those things. Um, this is a pretty typical way, I think, for concatenative synthesis to work, yeah? That, and you see this in lots of software packages, both that are non-real-time as well as real-time. You specify as a user a list of descriptors, and what you get out is the best match of, among, all of those, uh, among all of those measures of the sound. I tend to find this to not work super well all the time. Um, yeah, go ahead. How do you scale the different descriptors of distances against one another? So thanks, D is an object, um, as you can see, and there is just simply a weight. Uh, there's a weight keyword. Okay, but they're so all this in will whatever make. units they're in. They're normalized, so they're in. Oh, they're so they're all worth the same amount in the internal calculation. Okay. I'll talk about normalization, normalization yeah. in a second. Um, so, but you are able to weight the importance of one yeah, yeah, yeah. more than another to, to fine tune. Yeah, it's a good point to fine tune the, the balance between how all these things contribute to what's ultimately selected. My personal feeling about this is I, I find the more descriptors you add, the less meaningful the results tend to be. That you tend to get the more descriptors you add. I mean, it depends, all, of course, on the size of the corpus. But my general experience is that the more things you add, the more kind of results you get, which are kind of median. Like they're okay match for MCCs, it's okay for power, it's okay for centroid. But you don't get like you don't get sounds which really excel at matching one of those three categories. Um, it's for that reason that Audio Guide is structured, that the search uh, idea of Audio Guide is structured in a list. One is able to add several what are uh, what I call S pass objects, which essentially pass through the corpus um, as an entire list of possibilities and whittle down what the possibilities are and then pass it on to the next step. So search is a list because one is able to um, because one is able to specify a certain set of descriptors and return some percentage or some subset of what's possible to then another search that happens after that operates on a different set of descriptors. In fact, if you look at the first example as it's originally written, I'll go back to where it was, you'll see that search is actually a two item list in this case. The first S pass returns the closest 25% of sounds that match the effective duration and that it matched the power of all the sounds in the corpus, those remaining 25% candidates who did well at those first two steps are then passed on to the MFCCs. And this is a pretty typical setup to what I use, which is to say, um, Audio Guide you know, doesn't really care about duration unless you give it as a descriptor. And so you start with descriptors which are rhythm-based, which are power-based to kind of sift through the corpus and get sort of good matches in terms of temporality. And then later you go through and apply in a second step or a third step you apply Timbral descriptors to try to match timbre in this case. Um, MFCCs, yeah? Can you use something like a range, like the between these and mm -hmm. these? Yeah, so there are, uh, I'll say quickly what the S pass modes are. The first is closest. Um, there's also one that's furthest, which is the worst match, which actually isn't not meaningful. Um, it's almost like if you imagine the worst match of centroid, it's kind of like the inversion of centroid or maybe something like that. A little more complicated in MFCC land, but everything is. Um, what the worst MFCC match would be. But so there's a way to get the best matching sample, which is closest. There's a way to get the worst matching sample, which is furthest. You can do closest percent and furthest percent to return a, a range um, of matching samples. If I do, uh, if I remove this step and just say closest percent, Audio Guide will automatically pick randomly between the 25% returning samples. Um, and you can set those random seed if you want to get repeatable to the random result. So you can't set a range for how far it can be away. Like mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. That's what I'm getting to now. There's also one called ratio limit. Uh, this takes a descriptor. It has to be a segmented descriptor. Let's say F0. Or sorry, let's say F seg. That's fine. Just look at my screen. Always when I do these things, I try to look at that screen and type. It's really bad. Bad setup. So ratio limit takes two arguments, which are both, uh, which either both have, both can be there or only one can be there, and essentially says 
um, you tell what the minimum ratio is, and this is the ratio between, the, in this case, the target's effective duration and each corpus sample's effective duration. This essentially says that only sounds where the, the corpus duration is at least 90% of the target duration will get through to step two. So you can, does that answer your question? You can you, limit ranges. So you're always working these kind of relative values, so normalized descriptors and ratios, mm -hmm. rather than you're never working in the descriptors themselves and the raw values. Yeah, good. So, on that side, that is not a, that's an audio guide that is not a search parameter. That's actually a corpus parameter. Um, you can say limit, and the limit is a list of strings um, where you say centroid seg is less than 50%, which is returns only lets the Lakamon uh, corpus entries, which have the lowest 50% of centroids, into the pool. Or you cannot use a percentage and use a number if you want, like 300. So either percentages work or real-world real, real world descriptor values work. But that happens in the corpus level. The idea is that you've, you can filter, you can limit the sounds from each of these sound files or folders that make it into the corpus through a set of, um, a set of kind of greater than or less than or equals operations. Um, limit is a list, so you can make as many of them as you want, and they'll happen in order. So at, at the corpus filtering stage, you're dealing with the raw values of the descriptors, right. and at the search stage, you're dealing with kind of normalized. Of yeah, pretty. I think, off the top of my head, that is entirely true. Yeah, but there, there, are, there are no search pass things which deal with um, unnormalized descriptors or descriptors which are not, yeah, ratio to each other in some way. So yeah, the only real way to address matching of exact descriptor values, uh, I'll talk about normalization in a second, but the only real way to address it at the corpus level is through these limitations that happen on that corpus keyword argument limit. So the limit's really useful because you can say, I want the Lakamon sound file, but I only want the 50% softest, softest sounds that are in that sound file. Um, you can also specify limitations globally for the corpus and say, I've got 30 sound files and I only want the softest 50% of all of them, rather than on an entry-by-entry entry basis. So in the case of this search... If it's only relative, how do you deal with pitch? Um, if it's only relative, how do I deal with pitch in the search? Yeah. It's ratioed, so you're always matching to a target. So in a way, you're saying how many semitones away or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, so if you want to do how many semitones away in pitch, you just say F0. Yeah, do that. And then you say, you know, the minimum ratio is 9, 4, 3 or whatever it is. And that means that it has to be at least a half step or higher below the target. So if you wanted to only return F0s, if you only wanted to return pitches that are between... Uh, Half step in either direction of the target's F zero. That's your that's your that's ticket right there. Your ratio. And yeah, maybe there's a case to be made that more explicit controls for F zero might be useful. But most descriptors, you know, dealing with the wrong centroid numbers gets pretty difficult actually, or, or power numbers or MFCCs. I mean, who knows? You know, how to write concrete values and to do limitations. I mean, it might just be that some of the relative measures would be good to be able to express in decibels or something. Yeah. Just so that you don't have to remember <laughs> the ratio. Or the, the ratio. Of you mean you don't you don't have a terminal setup where you can type ratio and get all the ratios? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. F fair enough. Um, there's definitely room there for making the this more robust. But yeah, so the, the tricky thing is that normalization always happens because otherwise, if you have a list of descriptors like MFCCs, NF0, and Centroid, yeah, they yeah. have to be relatable to each other so that MFCCs aren't worth a bunch more because the numbers are a lot higher or power is worth something even though it has really small values. In the MFCCs, are you normalizing the same across all 13 dimensions or are you normalizing the dimensions? Each dimension is separate yeah. by default, um, but you can break out of that. I mean, the other way of thinking about that is to place the edges which is the way that I've used but for very different purposes, is to place the edges relative to these ratios. So that you know, so that like uh, an octave is worth um, 10 decibels or something like that. So the normalization, the, the, the thing about the normalization is it depends what's in your corpus. Right. Which may be what you want and you get a spread of things. Whereas you can keep, you can have weighting where you say like, okay, and one octave is the edge of my sweat search, and that will be a weight of one and 10 dB, and then you can actually have more control over 
Actually, real if you, world combination of those. If yeah. you flip your answer in a question, do normalization is on the potential full range of the descriptor or its actual values in the corpus? Ah, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the question. So let's say you have your snare shots. Let's talk about your snare mm -hmm. um, noodling. Uh, you will have a spectral centroid will have a very limited range. If you have violent noises, like you're gonna get even narrower uh, spectral yeah. spectral spread or timbral spread or variation, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, variations yeah. or but I'm looking for a word spectral spectral right. whatever. The full range of the descriptor won't be used. Are you normalizing against a potential full range of descriptors? Or are you normalizing against the corpus? By default, yes, and I'll answer that in a second. Okay. When I, when I talk about normalization. But yes, by, by default, my programmatic and also aesthetic answer is yes, always. And that sucks. Sorry, for, yes that yes sucks. to which one? Yes, that it should be normalized in a way that makes ranges fit each other rather than... So you normalize exact. to the corpus? No. You no, I, I stretch whatever the target's range is, I stretch to fit over the range of the corpus. So that yes, they have yeah, the same yeah. so you, you normalize on both of those things separately. So I'm, by default, it's matching descriptor variability rather than descriptor values, yeah. in a sense. And I'll talk about that in a second because it's an okay. important question and it's it's flexible in the software, but it's by default the answer is yes, because I. So no is the answer because my proposal. My proposal. <laughs> no, your question was an all question, so the answer. Yeah, it's a no. <laughs> that's why I don't understand it. Yes or no. So you normalize according to the corpus, and the, the range, the full range of so the corpus values. So if you have a narrow range of pitch, by default, yes, it will be zero to one in the corpus. Pitch. By default, yes, and excluding silence. So we only take active. We only take things that are segments. We ignore okay. when John Cage isn't speaking and Centroid does something crazy that mm -hmm. probably isn't meaningful to our understanding of that description. Um, yeah, so yes, let's, since we're talking about it, let's, let's get onto it um, in terms of normalization. So I've talked about, so I, I hope that gives you some ideas about searching. <coughs> and it's, it's potentially really interesting, this idea of saying, okay, F0 has to be within a half step, and then later it's got to be a duration pass, and then finally you do a pass that has to deal with timbre, something like that. The idea is that a hierarchical search, a search where you can specify as the user multiple steps of what matches and what gets what subset gets funneled to another search after that, I think is a much more powerful paradigm than a bunch a list of descriptors, which um, oftentimes I think, depending on your corpus, will yield mediocre matches because mm -hmm. you're trying to match lots of different properties yeah. like duration, like timbre, like power, like pitch. If you're trying to match all those things and putting them in a single pass. I think you get much less compelling the results. When you're doing, just sorry to interrupt again, but the point where you're doing your matching, now the way you've described it, means that actually the ratio doesn't mean that it will be a semitone away from the target. It means it will be a semitone away from how the target normalization matches the corpus. Oh exactly. uh, no, sorry. A ratio limit happens with unnormalized descriptor values. Okay. They are real world. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they are not. They are not normalized um, because. So ratio limit can only have one descriptor. You can't put a bunch of descriptors yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So it just uses raw values. Okay. And I felt like programmatically the best way to measure that was with a ratio. Yeah. Because in pitch, you're right, there's a more intuitive way, but amplitude. Well, no, I mean, you or, can convert all the other things to ratios. Yeah. 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 So that's a good point. That happens with unnormalized descriptor values. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this is kind of a, a little language for processing lists of songs, which is, is very interesting. Then I imagine that there may be situations where the user can screw up, like you can end up with a list that doesn't generate any sound. Like that. Yeah. Or do you try to force for them to choose something? No, I, I, and you can also write limitations in your corpus that mean that none of the sounds get through because if you make this list of the corpus filtering long enough and have contradictory kinds of things, you can also just eliminate your corpus and have no sounds. I essentially don't, I tell, the program doesn't pick anything. If nothing makes it through the corpus, it's a problem and the program tells you. But in the search passes, if nothing makes it through to the end, it will just be a silent segment. Or if you're layering multiple sounds on top but of each other, you will never be many sounds. There will always be a, la uh, at the end, you will pick one. No, I think you can, F up the search variables badly enough that it will not pick anything for some segments. Is there a min segment um, option in the superimposed? Oh uh, yes. Yeah. So There's you min. can always have one. But yeah, does that so mean it won't? Does that have to get through past go to superimposed? Yeah, but the problem is, that, yeah, no. I think actually with search, if nothing makes it through, if you put 
you know, I mean, F0 is actually a huge problem because you've, if you have a target where one of the segments is noisy and doesn't qualify to have an F0, you're basically not going to match anything for that. Um, and so the ratio limits start to fall apart for some of those descriptors. And then, no, actually, even if you say min segment equals one, it will still not pick yeah. something because nothing made it through. Nothing passed through. Right nothing that passed is. through. The way to learn about all that, or at least have some, because I realize even though the program has a GUI, it's not perfect or it's not ideal. In your output folder, and I'll talk about outputs at the end of my deep dive, there is a log.html which should talk to you, should, yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's, um, this, is, this is one of the strengths of the program, it's a log. <laughs> There's a log that sort of tells you what's happening um, and talks about normalization, you know, in a pretty technical way, but at least the data is there. It gives you some graphs of uh, different parameters. And then it um, goes through and talks about the number of things that made it through each search pass. So you started with 146, that got narrowed down to 36 because you asked for the best matching 25%. Of those 36, one was chosen in the closest pass. And so there is like a null, you effed up thing. That I'm probably more cordial than that. But there is something that tells you that nothing made it past and you're, you're not going to get anything here. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty good. It, that feedback to your user is very good. What you just said there, the, the, uh, the, the interactivity. You embrace the interactivity of not segmenting yet, but uh, at least of uh, querying. Yeah, segmenting could be a lot more interactive. Yeah. Is there like a matplotlib or something? A um, matliplot thing in Python? Uh, yeah, it was um, uh, Originally there was, and I was using it, but I found it to be such a cumbersome, yeah, it's, it's not an easy installation process, and so now I do it all with chart, JS chart, and yeah, doing yeah. HTML. So it just, I think the JS chart stuff is embedded in the program, so you don't have to have a web connection, but it just uses this, yeah. like a JavaScript-based plotting thing. Um, and you can see, let me reopen it. You can see um, not only information about normalization, which is useful, and I will talk about in a second, but you can also actually see the descriptor values of all the different descriptors that were used. Whether that's meaningful or not, I don't know, but th there they are. Um, MFCCs are a bit abstract. Yeah. And these other things starting with the website. I've thought about it, yeah. You mean having it be a server-based thing where you give it a, yeah, a call? Yeah, and it would like when you have a very basic interface, or people would want to do find scripts. And it would solve some legal issues too, which would be nice. But yeah, I've, so I've thought about it, um, and I think if I, so we always talk about building a GUI for it, that's, that's actually you know, not terminal based, and that is probably the direction we would go in if we made that choice, we could do an HTML5 sort of app that houses all of the stuff. And, and so like Flask, right? Yeah, like I don't Django, know, Django. Flask? Yeah, because you can just write all your Python and then embed it. Uh, Solves all the shit. <laughs> yeah, someone was trying to make a, a cocoa GUI. Yeah, and it was yeah, just yeah. it was just a nightmare. And the, the debugging of it was really challenging. And I want to be a composer, you know. Mm. <laughs> I really I, we we want to make a GUI for it, but we're we're struggling to find the time and also the right platform, the right the right development environment that is easy and intuitive. Ideally, Audio Guide should work on any operating system, and it would, except for the descriptor library is OSX based. So obviously, all the Python code works cross platform. But the descriptor analysis is a dylib that I... Could you, like, put your own inquiries there or not really? Um, I don't know. It's the best descriptor library I've found because it's got all the harmonic uh, spectrum features. It's got all the perceptual spectrum features, which I found to be useful. It's and I haven't found... It's isn't it? Sorry? It's Aircom script. Yeah. yeah. And I haven't found something that's as comprehensive and also as fast. Um, so, yeah, that's... It's something that's on the menu for a rainy monk. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, of, of time, but yeah, it's it's there. So I, I want to talk about normalization because it's come up, and I haven't said anything about it. So obviously, whenever you're measuring the similarity between features, and especially when you've got multiple features that you're measuring and trying to combine together to make a decision about similarity, you've got to do some normalization because the variability in a numerical sense between power of zero to one and f zero are completely different, and one has to, in some way, compress these numerical values in order to get similarity judgments that are sensical, especially ones that combine multiple descriptors into a single, um, into a single similarity uh, uh, value. Um, at the moment, let me just open this up really fast, sorry. At the moment, as I was just saying, um, so here's a, a plot of some target segments and some corpus segments. I don't remember what example this was from, but I think this is actually a pretty typical scenario for audio guide. And I know here I'm just showing you power and centroid. Um, corpus is in blue, target is in hot pink. 
And I think this is a pretty typical setup in the sense that often times targets are shorter than corpuses, if you just look at total duration of content. And also targets are usually a bit less expressive, generally speaking. I mean, this all depends on context. You could have a sine wave corpus that is not uh, expressive in various dimensions. Uh, or you could have a very short corpus that isn't very, doesn't have a lot of variation. But largely speaking, I think most of the concatenations we're working with, this actually might be the Cage and Lachemann example, um, now that I think about it, are like this. A relatively smaller expressive space in descriptor dimensions for the target in terms of total movement and a relatively larger space for the descriptors in the uh, corpus. In this case, you can see there's much more usage, especially of centroid, a good maybe two-thirds more of centroids that are above the target. Now, an initial question is, if you're doing concatenation with these segments, each one of these represents an utterance, both the target and the corpus, if you're doing a concatenation here, what do you want the program to do? I mean, one answer, of course, is you want it to pick the nearest match, and that's it, right? You want to, for each target segment, find in some multidimensional space its nearest neighbor or closest sound, however you want to say it, and that's the sound that you get as an output. So is this more normalized? This is unnormalized, more or less, yeah. More or less, I know that's not satisfying. I think we can tack on at the end of that. Um, yes, no, actually this is completely, no, I think everything is normalized between zero and one for each. But it's um, otherwise to the break, because otherwise. Right. Space. Would be zero to one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I have no idea why centroid is. Just, I mean, normalized fre um, frequency is a perfectly valid measure of, of centroid. I think it's just using a normalized frequency range. Sure, but the point here is that they are normalized relative to each other, which is to say that the, the well, variation of John Cage is kept relatively small, and the corpus is kept relatively it's large because that's the actual. Relative to the, than so or it's, something. It's, it's just a different representation. But if you would multiply it by the right value, you get you get the value in hertz. Right. It's, it's simply a yeah. The, the it's the scaling is all done. I think it's done with standard deviation and mean and standard deviation or something like that. But yeah, it's it's all you can get the original values back out. Um, but the point here is that I think this is a really typical situation for concatenative synthesis, a target which is less expressive in terms of its variability of descriptors and a corpus which is much more well endowed, which has a lot more resources. Now, two, there's two answers to what you want the program to do. The first, which is a perfectly fine answer, is no, I actually want the closest corpus sample every time, which will mean that you will use a relatively small portion of your corpus in terms of what's possible, yeah? Nothing on the left, the right-hand side of the corpus uh, plotting will be ever used because there's no way that, that those could be considered the closest. What Audio gu Guide does by default is it takes, sorry, here it is. I outsmarted myself. Um, it takes, um, by default, when you use descriptors, it will take them and normalize them so that they are occupying more or less the same space. And this is the normalization idea we were talking about before. By default, um, the mean and standard deviation of the target and the mean and standard deviation of the corpus will be used such that they, generally speaking, occupy the same space for every descriptor that's involved in concatenation. Now this works really well, I think, for some descriptors, especially especially things like tangible descriptors and FCCs. I think it works really well to, essentially you're taking the target's variability and kind of stretching it to fit over the corpus, if indeed your corpus is more variable than the target, which is often true. You're stretching the target's variability to meet or to to accommodate the variability that's inside of the corpus for each dimension of your feature space. And again, these are just segmented features where each dot is a segment, but this is also true for time-varying features as well. This kind of normalization happens in a similar way. So by default, um, things are always normalized such that the variability of the target centroids is stretched to fit the variability of the corpus and essentially ditto for every other dimension that's involved in concatenation. Um, However, it doesn't have to be. Um, if you're using F0, for instance, if you want to match pitches, obviously um, this scenario says that you are matching the contour of pitch. If you imagine a trombone being translated into bird song, you probably don't want to just ma match the closest pitch all the time. You want to match the variability of bird song to fit the variability of the trombone's rate. So in this case, you're matching F0 variability, if this were F0. In this case, you're matching discrete F0 values as close as you can get. Them. Scale variability. So if you like bird songs are within a third and your trombone is over four octaves, you'll have like very nuanced 
very things like because the contour will be mapped. So it, it, that's it, true. So that's that's a good point. I mean, the problem is the trombone is going to be down in raw values. The trombone will be here, and the bird will be up here. Is a problem. Is no the problem of non overlapping spectral like descriptive spaces. Yeah. And that's an interesting idea, though, this idea of... But there um, could be, yeah, there could be ways of transposing yeah. and, and controlling that so that you have an idea yeah. about how the values map on in, in real values. Like. And if anyone has ideas or suggestions about that, it's super easy to add. Let me talk a little bit about, the, uh, about how this works. Um, in other words, how you control this aspect of the program. In the documentation, there is some... I don't know. Did I get booted off Wi-Fi? Mm -hmm. So I have an idea. Um, I think what you could do is compute the, in the raw space the array similarity between each point in the corpus and each point in the target. That would give you a measure of that descriptor. How much does it overlap in, in terms of target <laughs> before spreading it? If you want to use raw values, it gives you a notion of which are the descriptors that overlap. Yes. And in other words, if they overlap well already, you don't mess with them. You, you don't care. Yeah. Just I mean, the other, yeah, the other kinds of things that might make this easier that I've thought about are, depending on your descriptor and what units already in, um, storing your descriptors in log format, mm -hmm. where everything that's now multiplicative becomes additive or subtractive. And now you can just slide things against one another, so you could just, you know, uh, so it's more easy to weight things um, because uh, the comparison is already, you know, if you're comparing frequencies, you're already comparing semitones essentially in terms of absolute distance and then you can slide them against one another quite at the scale and more, more, more ending. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, well, maybe we can chat about that a bit afterwards. Um, so the <clears throat> you specify descriptors with the D object. I haven't said anything about the D object yet, but it is, of course, a place where you write the descriptor name. You can uh, write weighting information. And then there is a normalization flag, which is not very responsibly programmed. If you give it a value of two, it will normalize the target and corpus separately, meaning it will stretch the corpus to fit the target or vice versa. If you give it a value of one, they will be normalized together and you will preserve relatively the, how the target fits in. So this norm flag, either one or two, if you want to therefore use F0 and have it be accurate, you just add the flag norm equals one, and then all of a sudden your F0s are normalized in a way that makes you, that makes it so it's matching actual pitch values and not pitch contour. There's also things you can adjust about um, how normalization is done, uh, standard deviation and max. There's also a couple other possibilities. Um, you can talk about, uh, you can address how distance is calculated. It's often by default done with Euclidean, but there's also piercing correlations and different kinds of things you can do to change the context of similarity. Again, these are all places in the program where adding functions would be really easy. So if you've got ideas about ways you'd like normalization to be changed or ways you'd like the evaluation of similarity, distance measurements, to be adjusted or using different kinds of algorithms, it's really easy for me to pop another <coughs> function and give that as an option for the D, the D object. Uh, finally, you can energy weight um, similarity calculations such that uh, for each frame of the target, if you're doing time varying centroids, for instance, for each frame of the target and corpus matching, uh, the penalty for how much it doesn't match will be lessened if the target is soft. By default, this is not enabled, but you can enable it uh, for each descriptor independently. So the idea here is you're able to adjust normalization weighting, but also things like normalization method for each descriptor in a separate way, which means that you can have F0 be normalized differently you know, in terms of pro programmatically from how MSUCs are normalized, which I think makes sense. Other questions or thoughts about normalization and or descriptors? Maybe just one clarification, the mm -hmm. D object, you can have several descriptors in, is that right? So no, but you can have several D objects as part of a pass. Right, okay, thanks. So a search pass has, a, a search pass type is the first argument, the like closest, yeah, yeah. and then it's an unlimited list of D objects after that that all combine together to make the choice for that pass. So distance is part of the D object, means that if you have multiple, each one would be measured according to different distances. Say it again. <clears throat> no, you just have different types. Of but you're always getting a zero to one yeah. value for distance there, or something that is normalized. And none of that. How are they combined when you have several in a pass? Um, they so are. are uh, they are combined. Yeah, they, I think they're just averaged, actually. Well, they're averaged. I believe so. So each one, you did distance measure as you specify here, and then you average the distance between the descriptors in that pass. 
Yeah, I guess. I'm oh, no, sorry. They, they must be additive. I'm sorry. They must be additive. I mean, the normal actually. thing would be to add the squares, and then. I believe that's what's happening, but I have to. That's the Euclidean. You know, right. like don't take the square root because why waste the? And you probably don't take the square root, but yeah, if you're doing it fully. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. Such that, so if you have a search pass that has centroid and it has noisiness, um, this will give you some value between zero and one. So will this, but it will be multiplied by 0.5 because it's weighted less. And then I, I probably sum the squares of those two to get a final answer, to get one final numerical representation of the similarity for that pass. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's, that's, that's the sum of squares. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, just a few quick words about. Um, I don't know what I'm going for. Oh, God, it's late. <laughs> Do I want to talk about outputs? Uh, you ask us to jump in. We jumped in. <laughs> <laughs> um, Audio Guide has, has lots of outputs. It does CSound by default. You have to download CSound, obviously, but you can also output a dict and use it in Max. Gilbert Nuno wrote a Max uh, Java player that plays renderings in Max 7 and 8, so you can use that. It's part of the distribution now. Um, and it writes uh, MIDI as well, so there's a bunch of different possibilities for output files that are detailed in the output file section. I want to now talk about some examples which I'm going to sort of contextualize as extending um, uh, this software or thinking about ways it can, be, it can move beyond just electronic music creation. I brought some scores. Is that, is that the right thing to do? I like them. Could I ask you to... You're the first. I'm the first to bring score to the Kirk Creator, which I like. Yeah. So I, um, well, I would be remiss to talk about you know, synthesis and audio without talking about musical writing. Musical writing is the awkward translation of a French um, phrase, which means, you know, computer-assisted composition in some in some sense. In the case of audio guide, I wanted to give you a couple of quick examples from pieces of mine of how I've used it. Um, also, I kind of hope this will elucidate and enliven this idea. How many pages people are supposed to um, use? It seems like Until you see 53 again. Okay. So that's yeah, I, I made 10. You made 10. Okay, I made we'll 10. So. I think we can share one behind you. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also hope that talking about these examples will give you some sense of this idea of the orchestrator's keyboard oh. to go back to this, my idea that Using sound files as using sound files as abstract vessels for specifying gestural intent is a kind of has a context in composition. Um, so what I do a lot, oftentimes with my pieces, I use my voice to create sort of temporary a temporary scratch space to articulate my ideas that then I eventually turn into by Michael music Jackson. by Michael Jackson exactly. Good. Um, and so I I always feel weird about sharing these in a the public context because they're kind of Dirty underwear. and silly or something? We, we call them dirty underwear. It's dirty fine. underwear. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to air my dirty underwear, which it's I hope, you, hope you've hope all done as well, so that um, I can feel a little bit less out in the open. Um, so um, I just want to give you some really simple examples. I, I do some more complicated targets, but for the purpose of the talk, I tried to keep it simple. <laughs> this first example is from a piece I wrote in 2015 for Ensemble Orchestral Contemporain, which um, was premiered in 2016 or 2015. The electronics were collaboratively made with Gilbert Nuno, who's a um, good guy, a composer and an improviser, and a very nice guy. Um, he's no longer a musical assistant at Aircom. He's like Olivier. Does he need like? No, uh, I, th I think he's done. I think. Yeah, but Olivier said it many done. times. Cut, they, they cut still this, buy um, him in. I thought they still buy him in. I think there's really rare occasions they might, but I think even rarer than Olivier is my understanding. We could talk about that after. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> off camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, this, the passage I just passed out is, of course, the, four, the full score of what, um, what eventually happened with my vocal target. But I just want to give you a sense of this is a kind of really simple example of me vocalizing to try to, to, try to dictate in a really intuitive and straightforward way what I want. Here's, uh, this is a four-part vo vocal target that essentially just consists of a couple of noises and some rhythms and some crescendos. <sighs> of course. Well, why would it work when I click on play? Okay, I'm going to look at the screen here. So here's my, my vocal target. 
see some pretty primitive noise categories, more or less, of which there are just maybe five or six that I'm putting in a kind of um, rhythmic dialogue with each other. Um, I used two of those four voices to create the electronic part for this section, and this was done with Audio Guide. So I don't know, I can't tell you which two they were, but two of the voices that you just heard, two of the layers you just heard, I did concatenative synthesis and picked noise sounds that I was working with to, you know, that, that tried to comport with the, the timbres and the trajectories in the sound file. So here's the electronic component of the passage in question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Dirac. just to refresh uh, with the original, and then I'll play the full uh, orchestrated version. For the full orchestrated version, I used large databases of sound files for noise sounds for all of these instruments, and Audio Guide picked the best combinations of sounds whose sum sounded like the target segment in question. I'm saying this now, and I just realized I didn't talk at all about layering in this talk, and the fact that Audio Guide actually calculates mixtures of sounds and not just single sounds to do matching which I will obviously say a word about after I play this example, but here um, I'm using the computer to select instrumental timbres in the case of noisy wind sounds, percussion sounds, and string sounds that fit the vocal variety and expression from the target. So here's the full uh, notated passage. <laughs> something about simultaneous selection. So it is possible in audio guide to pick more than one sound for any particular segment. And this is done, I think, intelligently, meaning when you pick multiple sounds to fit a target segment, it is not, it is aware of previous selections when it makes the next selection. It is aware of what's already been chosen. And I'll just talk pretty briefly now about how this works, because it's, I assume, interesting. Let's say we have a target segment of whatever, John Cage's voice, with the following amplitude. Um, when Audio Guide first picks a corpus sound to match it, let's say it picks something which eventually, it eventually arrives at picking a corpus sound which has the, this amplitude profile. The first thing Audio Guide does is it subtracts the amplitude, the raw amplitude of the corpus sound from the target sound, and the segmentation algorithm is rerun and a future selection is made so with. This, similar to the sort of thing that happens in orchids or today. Similar. the kind of residual you're calculating on the residuals? To, uh, from, amp from an amplitude perspective first, yes. Okay. Well, Orchidea is much more sophisticated than audio guide in terms of what's happening under that. Um, but so uh, amplitude is subtracted, and the next selection only happens if the sound is still loud enough to warrant another selection. If the sound gets totally obliterated at the beginning but still remains, it will pick a sound that happens later in time to make a combination of sounds. Um, what happens at the descriptor level, meaning the similarity calculations, this is just a subtractive sort of power method that happens first for subsequent selections. Um, when it then tries to look at, okay, what sound am I going to pick to now match this segment, given that the power has been subtracted, it will mix together, it'll take the, the sound that was previously selected and put it into a new array, and it will look at corpus sounds, and it will actually sum the descriptors together to try to find a match for both of those sounds happening at the same time. This is done with a pretty simple algorithm which just says, and this is from an ear common thesis of like 2008, that basically says that for most descriptors, most spectral descriptors, this weighted sum of 
the weighted average of descriptor space pretty much maps out with a high degree of percentage to what you would actually get if you mix those two sounds together and analyze their features. So it is on the fly, not just doing a subtractive amplitude model so that you get, you try to get full coverage of the target sound if the corpus sounds happen to be shorter. It's also then when it probes descriptor space looking at the mixture of all the previous sounds that have been selected to represent that segment and all the new candidates and looking at how they mix together and looking at that array to get the official descriptor values that are used in some calculation. So will those two, that mix should be time aligned to start together? No, they don't have to be. Okay. So you can if, actually have like a sort of mosaic little... Yeah, you can have a mosaic. I mean, if the idea is that if the corpus sound was really loud at the start and basically took out through the subtractive amplitude model the target's attack, it then will advance <coughs> through the target segment until it gets to a point where the target's loud enough to make another selection. Right. Meaning it will be mosaic. It will be yeah. arranged in time like that. Yeah. Did you have to try all the possible combinations of all the you know, sums of all the possible units of the corpus? That you get destroyed. Yeah, so it's not doing that. It's not doing all of the possible combinations. It's picking the best one first, mm -hmm. and then for the next selection, it's looking at all the other possibilities from the corpus combined with the one that's already been picked. First past the post. Yeah. With all the problems. So it's still greedy, and you know, it's still, it's still picking a winner initially without any idea about what's going to happen next. Yeah. But then when the next selection happens, it knows something about what happened before. Yeah. So that's how you end up with audio guide concatenations that. Um, are not let's see where is it are not simply you know one stream of sound but are actually a mosaic overlapping version of sounds like this one this is the snare drum example we heard before uh, and this is a version of it that is broken into separate sound files for each sort of overlapping segment and you can see that the the arrangement of them sort of interlocks in a pattern of amplitude that tries to follow John Cage's amplitude this is the snare drum example we heard at the beginning but is broken down into four different voices. This is because max segment was set to four in the superimposed object, of course. Uh, so here's, the, here's this sound just to remind you of how it sounds. The idea here is that you can make a much more, I think, interesting and compelling version of the target by uh, overlapping and making a composite of all of these different utterances of the tor tar uh, corpus that don't start at the same time, but it can be staggered, such that when they're added together in an amplitude way, they more closely fit John Cage because of this. And also from a descriptor perspective, by mixing the descriptors together internally, you're, you're hopefully arriving at a place where the the out, the, out, the Descriptor value for all of these sounds mixed together is what's approaching the target values. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That was kind of quick and dirty, but that's um, that's how the simultaneous selection works. Um, I think audio guide's pretty unique this way, except for Orchidae and Orchid, which has a really good simultaneous matching algorithm, if I may say so. Um, most other programs that I know about uh, don't really do this. The, every future selection, even if it overlaps, is completely unaware of what happened before. Audio guide's approach isn't perfect because what happens first wins, and that's probably not the best solution, um, which is not what ORCID does. But um, this is the way that it tries to navigate that space of doing all combinatorial po possibilities, which is not really feasible, and doing something which is a bit. The other thing greedy. is the time based matching, but keeping sounds intact. That's not very common. Yeah. So looking at time series of descriptors, it tend to work frame by frame, object by object. Um, what do I want to do? I want to say, if it's okay, just give a few more comments. I don't want to go over time. We have to, what, 12, 15? But I want to just say a few more things um, that I think, I hope are, are interesting. Um, the first one is I want to talk about um, real-time processing and synthesis. Um, I've been experimenting with, and I've been using this in quite a lot of my pieces, um, creating databases of variations for processing parameters that then I use later guided by a target. And so I'm going to talk pretty quickly because I've only got 10 or 15 minutes about how I do this to give you a sense. But this is one of the ways I kind of extend audio guide into the domain of synthesis as well as real-time processing. So I start with the clarinet sound, uh, a, st a stable sound like this one. I then pick some processing algorithm. In the case of this example, I think I picked pulse wave modulation 
and some other kind of filtering algorithms, which are all chained together. Um, I think in total there are six input parameters. And I take each of those input parameters and decide a max and a min value and a number of steps in between them. And I then make a database taking this clarinet sound and all possible combinations of those six parameters. And you end up with um, something like this. Sorry, database. I think there is. That's gradually stepping through all permutations of six different processing parameters to create a kind of database of possibilities with a, with a given processing and with given mins and maxes for each of the parameters. I don't have it in the clarinet uh, version, unfortunately, but here's one I'm doing with cello. And essentially, I write into a labels file all of the different values so that I keep them for later. Then I run audio guide with it, using this as a database. And I pick a sound for each frame um, in a very irresponsible way that makes bad sound and concatenative synthesis, in my humble opinion. But what it gives me is it gives me a value for each of these six parameters for a processing algorithm for each frame, such that it will make parameter envelopes for each of these six values for the clarinet, which match somehow the target's sound profile. So that was my clarinet database. I run it on a target. Uh, in Audio Guide to pick for each frame, each FFT frame of the analysis, what's the best matching processing sound of that stable sound. My target is, of course, our friend. I then said to David Tudor. Um, it makes, makes it a little easier to get presentations by not having changing all of your uh, uh, targets all the time. And so here's the resulting output. I essentially um, only pass the clarinet sound through it. I, I use the John Cage's uh, amplitude as a gate, so you only hear the processing when Cage speaks. But here's how it sounds. This is the sound of the clarinet. And I've essentially got parameter envelopes that follow whose, whose inner, inner machinations will give us something like the timbral profile of John Cage's voice. I'll be able to get all so here we have concatenative synthesis solving, I think, the same kind of problem in the world of um, synthesis and real-time processing, that you've got a lot of options available to you in terms of parameters and processing routines, but not a lot of help designing time. And so here we're using concatenative synthesis to pick parameterizations of these algorithms to try to create intuitively a morphological idea that then we can instantiate with real-time processing. This is not standard part of audio guide. This is, has some dirty laundry scripts, dirty undies. Uh, I have a colleague uh, who, who speaks this is a couple of years ago. Yeah. And he was very much tackling this problem and the polyphonic problem. Yeah. So it might be just this grand problem. Mm -hmm. I did a similar process with my modular synth, which is way less predictable than your digital processing. You can get some funny results, like, in, like having the robot plow through combinatorial change parameters in a non-linear set, get descriptors out, and then try to reproduce birds. It's quite fun. Yeah. Um, you can get very complex, yeah, control, as you said. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's the same problem. You've got all these amazing parameters to tweak, but you don't mm -hmm. know how to change them independently, and also how they, how they correlate and how to move them together. And so we're all don't want to speak for everyone, but I'm sitting there drawing breakpoint envelopes to try to get certain results when actually I could just express myself with my voice and then transform that into, into a transform a, a space for those parameters to move, which is, for me, much more intuitive and straightforward. Um, Have you seen yes. this Stefano Fashini's work in this area? No, I haven't. Oh. He's doing this dimensionality reduction with the same kind of thing, so voice control of synths and voice control. Oh, interesting. Of His website is demo. The YouTube stuff is quite clear. Yeah, uh, cool. well, I'll check it out. Finally, one last example, because we all need um, to feel better about our current political <laughs> situation. Um, one final thing, and this is something I've never done anything serious with, so you'll see that the seriousness of my example comports with my lack of really engaging with this from an aesthetic point of view. But um, here we've got a target sound file, which is an old printer. And for my, tar for my corpus, I'm, 
For my corpus, I'm going to use a 10-minute section of a speech by Theresa May. Well, leadership of the CBI as Director General. And also, welcome John Allen, who's taken up his... Um, yeah. So I strip, I strip the sound out of the video, and I use that as my corpus. I segment it in audio guide, and I run audio guide like normal. Um, interestingly, I normalize it uh, with the one option, which means that the printer has a pretty small space. I mean, she's completely pitched, the printer's completely noisy, and so it actually ends up catching most of her noise. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. It was a bad joke, very bad on camera. Ends up catching most of her noise, so most of her incidental... Fricative sounds as well as breathing and stuff Every like that. Every time she speaks, it's quite noisy. Yeah, I didn't, it wasn't a random choice. Um, <laughs> a knackered old printer. Um, so here's the output we get from Audio Guide, taking her sound as a corpus, taking um, uh, the old printer as a target. Three, four. Um, you'll, uh, I just want to say quickly, this uses a different concatenate strip called concatenate frames, which doesn't do segment-based concatenation, but which does sliding concatenation. It's, it's in the program, and it's somewhat documented, so you can take a look at that uh, if you're interested. Um, but what I want to say about this is that I then took the video of May, decomposed it into frames, you know, images for each frame, and because I, with the output file, know the starting end times of all the segments, was able to concatenate the video file to, to match the segments that I picked. Now, some of the frames in the video file, some of the moments in the concatenation, there's multiple sounds overlapping at the same time. And so for that, I used a really old, uh, oldie but goodie image magic to composite multiple frames of Theresa May when, she's, when multiple sounds of her are overlapping at the same time and I weight how much the alpha influences it by the power of the sound. So if it's a really soft sound, it has a really light impact on the video, but when there's louder frames, when there's louder sounds, the frame gets treated more, um, has, more has more density, has more visual impact. So as a result, we're able to kind of do, use the concatenation of sounds to then concatenate a video. Again, this is all done with FFmpeg and um, Image Magic, and here's what we get. Oh, sorry. I don't ever want to open QuickTime. I need to find a way to do it. Can you show me the keyboard? VLC. VLC. Yeah. So there's a way for VLC to open everything. <laughs> and so here we go. Um, obviously, it's fast and quite uh, bitey in terms of the segmentation. Um, <laughs> but here's the resulting video with the sound that you just heard that follows the segment selection. Three, four. This is just like a video in which she dances. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think this one. Yeah, exactly. 